Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Smart Chart Webinar Series focused on SEM and EDS. My name is Rena Samsu, Marketing at EAG Laboratories, a Eurofence company. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items for today's event. All attendees have been muted. However, we'd still love to hear from you during today's presentation. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to, today, to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions panel located in the bottom right of your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. At the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is greatly appreciated and will help us to improve our future events. And I would now like to introduce John Mosquito, expert in material science at EAG Laboratories. Thank you, Rena. And thank you all for coming uh, to attending the uh, Smart Chart webinar series. Let's get started. Okay. My name is John Mosquito. I'm the account executive and also a senior technical specialist based here in Sunnyvale, California for EAG Materials Laboratories. Um, 20 years experience in materials characterization. Um, but let's see, what I, what I wanna say first of all is, again, this presentation is, is about SEM EDX, but what I wanna do first is thank you all for coming in. And I'm assuming that you're all practicing social distancing and for those, especially those on the front line here, listening to the seminar, doing essential services in the medical and health related uh, fields, a big thank you for doing what you do and, and also taking the time to listen in. Today's webinar is about uh, SEM EDX. We'll start with an introduction to EAG, the smart chart, and then talk about the fundamentals of SEM EDX, methods of operation, Examples, including surface imaging, EDS analysis, and cross-sectional analysis using focused ion beam, and then finish up with strengths and limitations and complementary techniques. EAG Laboratories is a part of the Eurofins network of labs. Our expertise focuses within the realm of materials analysis and specifically surface characterization. We offer advanced imaging capabilities in all of our locations across the United States, in Shanghai, China, in Europe, the rest of Asia, and also in Europe. Taken together, EAG Laboratories is a team of several hundred employees. Most of us have advanced degrees working in laboratories around the world. Our state-of-the-art equipment and really the breadth of our expertise lets, lets us help you do your best work. The smart chart. The smart chart is a spectroscopy and microscopy and analytical resolution tool. We can use it to take our needs and put them in, literally into a box and understand what the options are in analytical techniques. Down here at the bottom of the box along the, the x-axis is analytical spot size, how large of an area the technique will encompass. In practical sense though, it really tells us how small of an area can I actually analyze. From centimeter sized here on the right hand side of the box through micron regime and then down into the nanometer, we have a technique that can probably image and analyze what you have. On the, the y-axis, we have composition. Within the box, these techniques will give us composition. Again, here at the top, is it matrix level, percent level compositions, then down through parts per million, parts per billion, and finally ending in parts per trillion detection limits. So all of these techniques are available. The right technique is the one that gives you the analytical spot size plus the detection limits that you need. Outside the box, here on the right-hand side, are the bulk techniques. These are not surface sensitive techniques, but give us information from the bulk of the, of the material. And then down here at the bottom are our imaging techniques, our TEM, our SEM, or EBSD, that give you an image so you can actually see um, what, your, what your sample looks like. And in this case, we're gonna be concentrating on SEM and EDX. 
SEM as an imaging technique outside the box, and EDS within the box to give us matrix levels composition. SEM is an excellent technique for obtaining high resolution images, and EDS is a fast way to identify elemental content. But X and Y sizing isn't the only dimension you need to be thinking about when you think about surface analysis. We can compare the analytical techniques by their depth of, of, of penetration, their depth of analysis. On the left-hand side, we have the very surface sensitive techniques, AFM, time of flight sims, OJ and XPS, which looks at the very near surface from the first few atomic layers down to, oh, about 10 nanometers. Other techniques look deeper, Raman, RBS, XRR, deeper into the material still. And then finally, the, the almost bulk techniques, XRD, XRF, TEM, when done in a cross section, and SIMS as a depth profile. Here next to that is the SEM EDX that we're gonna be talking about. And here, we're at the near surface, and we're also down to 1,000 nanometers, which is a, a one micron in depth. But what we'll find out here is that depth is variable, and we can use that variability to our advantage in doing our analysis. Now, before going further, I wanna talk a little bit about accuracy and precision. These are two words that we use. Normally they're used interchangeably, but here at, at EHE Laboratories, we use them in a very precise way. So accuracy has to do with how correct the measurement is to the true value of the material. So if you're looking at the composition, how accurate or how close is it to the true value? Precision, on the other hand, is when I do a test, do I get the same number again and again and again? So here, low accuracy and low precision, nobody needs that. A technique that has both low accuracy and low precision is not really a, a useful technique at all. It's really more of a guess. High accuracy, on the other hand, means that the measurements have a good average accuracy, but they're not precise. So you can take advantage of this by doing a number of tests, you will arrive at the true correct value. Then we have low accuracy, but high precision. And here, the measurements have good precision, meaning reproducibility, but are not accurate. We can take advantage of this though, because now, instead of going for an accurate measurement, we can look at a precision, comparisons, good versus bad, process one versus process two, you know, sample one versus sample two. By having good precision, we can look at the differences and in failure analysis, and especially as, as you get more and more to the near surface, precision is, is, is more powerful than accuracy. And then of course, both measurements and where measurements are both precise and accurate, that's the best of both worlds. Unfortunately, you, you rarely get there with, with an, analytical techniques at the near surface. So let's dive into scanning electron microscopy and energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. The key applications, any time you need the resolution or the depth of field beyond that of an optical microscope. Optical microscopy runs out at somewhere around a micron in size, where you can't see smaller than that. SEM, however, has a resolution good down to single digit nanometer, where the, where the best microscopes now have nearly one nanometer resolution. It's an indispensable tool for failure analysis, and really it's a great first look at a, at a problem to see what it is. You know, the old saying, a picture says a thousand words. Well, that's absolutely true. Being able to see what you're, what, you're, what you're dealing with, see what the problem looks like, literally, can help you move very quickly to a solution. And then combined with EDX to measure elemental content, we're able to look at elemental distribution on a micron scale. It's a fast technique. It's a survey technique, meaning that we don't have to specify what elements we're looking for. EDX allows us to discover what's present within that analytical volume. And its detection ability is nearly complete across the entire periodic table, going from 
at this point now, lithium all the way through uh, up to uranium. And then quantification um, can be very accurate, but depends upon the application. So let's take a look at the primary and secondary processes of what happens when we put a sample into an SEM. We have an electron beam coming in. Here, we're going to interact with the, with the material in, at the surface, and we can get a backscattered electron. Or that electron beam can come in and kick off an inner core electron. That's our secondary electron. Once we kick out that inner electron, we have an excited ion. There's a relaxation process that'll happen. And one of the processes, the first one, is a relaxation of an outer core electron dropping in and giving off a fluorescent X-ray. This characteristic X-ray has a very defined energy characteristic of the element it came from. We're gonna use this in our EDX analysis. Another relaxation process is the OJ electron emission, where an outer shell electron drops in, but instead of creating an X-ray, an outer another outer shell electron comes off, leaving the, the, the atom doubly ionized. This OJ electron is also useful, um, not necessarily in SEM, but as OJ is the technique itself. And then finally, we have other events going on, inelastically scattered electrons and Bremsstrahlung radiation. Those are secondary processes that we're not gonna look at. So we can take advantage of these simultaneous techniques and with the proper detectors, provide ourselves with images. Each of, each of these phenomenon is distinct and provides a unique image of the near surface region. So literally in the SEM, by flipping a switch on the instrument, we can acquire three different images, the secondary electron image, the backscatter electron image, and a fluorescent or characteristic X-ray image using the EDX detector. Few analytical tools provide the dexterity in acquiring data that a modern SEM can, can provide. Now, at this point now, we're gonna be talking about three basic types of detectors and the images that, that come from them. But in modern tools, state-of-the-art tools at this point, there's a blurring between backscatter detector and secondary detector. In some of our newest tools, our G4 and our Vario systems that we've acquired this year, these are state-of-the-art tools that have multiple detection modes or imaging modes, where instead of just having two detectors, we can actually mix and match and segment so that now those options are not just two, there's 12. Um, and then combining that with other detectors in, in, in these tools, EDS detectors, EBSD detectors for electron backscatter diffraction, uh, focused ion beams for dual beam cross-sectioning. These are very, very versatile tools which have amazing capabilities. So we're gonna talk about basic imaging, but there is a whole new field of, of how we can create the best image for the particular sample going forward. So what I do recommend is that if you have, have questions about how to image, we can dive in deep on that during, either during the questions or in separate conversations um, offline uh, from this, this presentation itself. Okay, but all of these processes, the secondary backscatter and, and characteristic X-ray processes are not equal. Even though the secondary backscatter and X-ray signals are produced concurrently from where within the depth of the sample they originate varies considerably between these modes. Here's a cartoon of the cross section of the sample where the electron beam is coming down and, and coming into this into and hitting the surface. So even though the beam is finely focused, as it enters the sample, once it, once it enters the sample, it scatters. And it scatters into a pear-shaped cloud of interaction. Each of these processes within the, occur within the entire volume of this interaction, but only those within a certain distance of the surface will make it back out of the sample and into the vacuum of the chamber and eventually reach the appropriate detector. OJ electrons are the most surface sensitive. They come from the first three to five nanometers of the surface. Next, secondary electrons. They come from between 10 and 20 nanometers of the surface. 
backscatter electrons come from deeper. And characteristic traits, again, come from deeper still. So even though we know very precisely the energy of the beam coming in, where it's hitting, where these signals come, even though they're created all at the same time, the signals that we record in our detectors come from very, very different regions within this volume of interaction. Also, stray radiation, secondary fluorescence from that radiation again, um, is included in here all. Also. Okay, we are going. So that cloud of interaction can change. It changes with, with direction of, of the beam. It can change with beam energy, going deeper with higher beam energy, smaller with lower beam energy, and the physical makeup of the sample itself. So how big is this volume? It is dependent on the incoming beam energy and the material properties of the sample. But in general, to a first order approximation, as a good rule of thumb, the diameter and depth of this volume is about 10,000 angstroms for a 10,000 volt beam. So a 10 kV incoming beam setting, we're getting 10,000 angstrom diameter, 10,000 angstrom depth. So that's equivalent to one micron width and depth. It's a good rule of thumb. Similarly, 5,000 volt, 5 kV electron beam in coming in on the surface, excitation volume, 5,000 angstroms, or about half a micron in diameter, and again, a half micron depth. These are just approximations. Your results will vary depending upon your material, but it gets you in the right realm to understand where you are in the excitation volume and where your signals are coming from. So secondary electron images. These images highlight the differences in the surface topography where the surfaces more favorably aligned to the secondary detector show up brighter in the, Im in the SC image. Really what that means is topography matters. It's a surface sensitive phenomenon where the information typically comes from the topmost 10 to 20 nanometers. It also provides the best spatial resolution of all imaging modes. Unfortunately, there's no free lunch, so secondary electron images are also the most susceptible to surface charging artifacts. So what do they look like? Magnification is your friend. By looking at, at the very near surface, we get a look of the surface. And by changing the magnification, in this case, it's, it's an image of a hydroxyapatite coated knee implant, we can look at the implant, look at the coating, zoom in and look at the length of the crystals of the hydroxyapatite. But even more, we can zoom in and take a look at the diameters. This is what secondary electron imaging is, is best used for, ultimate spatial resolution. Backscatter electron images, on the other hand, highlight different Differences in the average atomic number. High Z, num Z number materials show brighter in a backscatter image, and BSE images can also provide additional advantages, meaning that they probe deeper. We have we're going, we're coming from deeper within that 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 excitation volume. This can allow observation of a subsurface layer where we, we tailor that that backscatter volume to be precisely at the depth that we, that we want to be looking at. BSE images also are less susceptible to charging artifacts on insulating samples. And also, backscatter uh, detectors are compatible with variable pressure environmental SEMs. So what is a Z number? I get this question often uh, during my live presentation, so I wanted to make sure I put this in here. Here's a periodic table. Low Z number elements are those at the top of the table, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen uh, within the table. These are low Z number elements. Conversely, high Z number are the ones at the bottom of, of the periodic table, the gold, the platinum, the lead. So when we're talking about backscatter imaging, we're talking about average Z number. And so gold 
high Z number elements, gold will show brighter than low Z number elements. However, if we were looking at aluminum on top of silicon oxide, aluminum in a backscatter image, aluminum would actually look brighter relative to a silicon dioxide background. So again, it's not the Z number itself, it's the relative or an average Z number of the materials that you're looking at. So what does a BSE image look like? So we have two images here. On the left-hand hand image is a secondary electron image. And this is an image of a platinum catalyst on a, on a carbon backbone support. Okay, here the primary contrast mechanism for the, for the secondary electron image is topography. We see the roughness of the carbon-based support structure and the nooks and the crannies and the roughness of, of, of the sample. Now, if we switch, literally reach over, flick a switch, and look now at the backscatter image, here on the right-hand side, what we see is the primary contrast mechanism now is average Z number, where carbon is a low Z number element and shows dark relative to the platinum, which is a high Z number. So dependent upon what you're interested in observing, the surface area of the carbon skeleton or the distribution of the platinum here in the, in, and, the, and the size of the platinum particles on, on the catalyst uh, structure, you choose the, the imaging that gives you that advantage. Taking advantage of these various image modes uh, available can make the task literally, in the case of a backscatter image, black and white. Energy dispersive spectroscopy, EDS. We also call it EDX, energy dispersive X-ray, EDDX, XEDX, many different acronyms for the same technique. But what it does, it provides an elemental analysis based on the characteristic X-ray emissions from the sample. EDX detectors are a common uh, feature in, in electron beam microscopes, SEMs, and that's why we include it here. So, Again, we're looking now at the entire excitation volume uh, as the source of our characteristic X-rays. We can go in and take a spectrum, and what we have, here's a representative EDX spectrum. At 5 kV, we excite characteristic X-rays up to, oh, but not all the way up to the 5 kV beam uh, primary energy that we're using. The peaks kind of peter out somewhere around 60% of that beam energy. So a good rule of thumb is, depending upon the peaks that you want to excite, 1.5 times that peak energy is the, is the minimum beam energy that you want to be using to excite the peaks uh, of interest. And here in this particular residue, we see a number of characteristic peaks. We see oxygen, iron, sodium, silicon. There's also chlorine. The, from these peaks, we can they, it's, we get families of peaks. Oh, we also see carbon. Uh, families of peaks, chlorine, three three characteristic peak characteristic peaks. What we don't see are the other peaks for iron, which are up above the five kV that we're using uh, to excite the, the peaks in the first place. So this is very uh, typical spectrum that we would expect from an EDX. We can then take these these intensities and quantify them uh, relative to each other where the quantification is, is the sum of all, all the peaks on the areas and goes to 100% uh, concentration. However, this isn't the only story. So we want to be able to use EDX and excite the peaks. At 5 kV, we peter out at somewhere around three and a half uh, kilovolts for peak detection. If we now, on the same, exact same area, we go to 10 kV, now, we start to see the higher energy peaks. Again, we're not exciting the, the super high energy relative to the incoming beam energies, but we excite the, the K lines for the, for the iron. We also now excite chromium K lines and calcium uh, K lines relative to, to the peaks that we saw here. What's interesting is now at higher beam energies, we actually see the chromium K lines where the L line was actually hidden by, by the oxygen peak. So without going to the higher KVs, we would have actually missed an element that technically showed up in our EDX spectra, but because of peak overlaps, 
was invisible to us because we we only identified oxygen from the from the 5 kV uh, spectra. So using beam energy will how allow us to excite additional peaks to help understand and identify the the peaks that are present in the low energy spectra. Here's another example. This is of a, of a, of a solder. This is a lead tin solder, which is a two-phase material. The survey spectrum averages the x-rays from an area and gives us the average signal over the area scanned. So what we detect here within this large area is the lead and the tin, oxygen also included. So once we have identified these elements, because the electron beam can be rastered, we can actually map the intensities of select peaks. And show the intensity as a function of position. So this is a map of the intensity of the lead peak. We can do the same for the intensity of the tin peak. So what we end up with is a series of maps that show intensity or the relative composition as a function of position. This is very powerful. But we also need to be careful too, because what's black in a, in a map is not 0% tin. It's just the lowest concentration of tin within our, within our spectrum. The look, so black is not zero. And conversely, bright is not 100%. Maps are only consistent within themselves and give us the relative intensities of the target target peak of, of interest and don't necessarily give you composition. So this is a common mistake that we that people use with maps. We want to make sure that we understand that it's relative compositions and black does not mean zero. So quantification. So in theory, EDX quantification is excellent on homogeneous samples. For best quantifications though, you need standards including standardized acquisition parameters and having a, a standard analyzed on the same machine under the same conditions at the same time. This will give you your best uh, representative uh, reference spectra to compare against your unknown. EDX sees everything from lithium on up at this point, does not detect hydrogen and helium so that because there are no characteristic x-rays. Newest systems, can detect lithium. Most systems get down to about beryllium um, and almost all of them will get you at least down to carbon and then see everything above that all the way to uranium. Detection limits, how small of a concentration will, will give me a peak, that is directly related to Z number. You get a greater X-ray yield with increasing atomic number. So it's easier to see very small concentrations of platinum versus that same amount of that same atomic concentration of aluminum. So increasing Z number gives you better detection limits. Also, quantifications do not change significantly with chemical state. And so it's 99.9% .9 always okay to ignore chemical state when doing quantification by EDX. So here's an example now where quantification doesn't quite work. So this is a example that me and a friend, Tom Shoreline, made up a couple of years ago where we took a microscope slide, simple microscope slide, and coated it with about 500 angstroms of iridium. At 10 kV, our EDX easily shows the iridium peak. It also shows an iron peak, both the K, the, uh, the K shell, and also we'll, we'll see down here the, the uh, L shell of, of the iron. So we, we see both the iridium and the iron of the coating. But what we also see is the glass substrate. We see the silicon, the oxygen, potassium, the calcium, sodium, uh, magnesium of the glass. So we're looking at a two-phase material. We can do the same thing at 20 kV. And now we see the differences in, in analytical volume. The ratio between the iridium coating and the glass becomes skewed towards the glass itself. 
the iridium signal goes lower. Concentration of iron becomes so low in the in the analytical volume that we that we're looking at in that the peak is very hard to detect and, and really is not the high energy peak here is not detected uh, any longer in the 20 kV spectra. And what we see is greater concentrations of the ionic com uh, components of the glass, the silicon oxygen and the ionic components. So at 20 kV, the surface elements become a smaller percentage of the total volume. So their peak energy peak intensities are reduced relative to the substrate peaks. Higher beam energies accept higher X-ray beams. So we're allowed actually to see the iridium peak here uh, at the 20 kV line. And in both cases, excitation volume extends into the sub substrate layer. So now that we're looking at a two-phase material, quantification will not be accurate. But we can take those peaks and we can create a con atomic concentration table, or in this case, a, a weight percent table. The instrument and the, and, the, and the software allow us to do that at any time. However, and quantification is based on the peak intensities of the elements that are detected. In this example, the layer that we, the, the system that we have is a 500 angstrom layer, 500 angstrom thick layer of, of nearly pure iridium on, on, on a glass. Both spectra show significant concentrations found in the glass. But if the sample is not hom homogeneous within our sampling volume, these quantifications are not accurate. By compare, and so at 10 kV, we see 24% oxygen, 22% silicon, and 42% iridium. And at 20 kV, we see 16% iridium. Which is correct? The answer is neither are correct. In both cases, because we're looking at a two-phase system, the the concentration of iridium in that layer is not correct. And so both are, are not useful in an absolute scale because the accuracy is not there. What we can do though, is look at the precision, look at the change in the compositions. And here we see by knowing that at 10 kV, we have a certain volume, but at 20 kV, we, we go deeper in the material by seeing the iridium drop in concentration, the iron dropping in concentration with greater volume, or, or excuse me, deeper volume, that tells us both the iridium and the iron are at the surface. So we can use that as a, as a comparative and a precise measurement um, to see the change in the composition as a function of excitation volume. So to go back to EDX and quantification, in practice, Quantification assumes a homogeneous sample within that sampling volume. If the sample is not homogeneous, quantification is not accurate. But we can take advantage of precision instead. Look for relative differences between samples. Look for changes between sample one versus sample two, good versus bad, process one versus process two. These relative differences are precise in, in the EDX, especially when they're taken at the same time, under the same conditions, hopefully with the same instrument, these are gonna give you your best result and you will give you actionable results. Other, other uh, considerations when doing EDX spectra is carbon contamination. Carbon is prevalent within the SEM chamber and will add error to your quantification both because there's carbon literally in the atmosphere of the chamber and, and can be energized and create its own X-rays, but also with carbon burn-in. That's that black looking square that when you zoom in on, 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 a, on a sample, look at that very precise area that's, that's of interest. And then as you back off, you see this black square, that is literally carbon being deposited by the heated electron beam onto the exact area that you wanna do your EDX. So carbon cont contamination will add the error in into your quantification because if you quantify it, it's an artifact and it will add to, add to your 100% of, of concentration. Ways around it, ignore carbon. Quantify the spectra by ignoring, ignoring these artifact peaks. Carbon is a big one, but also any metal coatings you might have applied to the surface to help with conductivity, iridium, gold, platinum, tungsten, these help in, in alleviating charge, and you don't want to quantify those peaks because it, it will 
reduce the intensity, or excuse me, reduce the concentrations of, of the elements that are actually part of your sample. Many EDX systems do not target, or excuse me, detect the lighter elements. And in general, they're, they're poor in concentration with all elements lighter than oxygen. Again, take advantage of precision and look for relative differences. Because even though it may not be an accurate uh, concentration, the differences between samples or between areas will be precise, especially when done, again, at the same time, under the same conditions, with the same instrument. So take advantage of precision. And then lastly, relatively broad peaks cause spectral overlaps between common elements. Take more spectra. More data is always a better thing. Higher voltages excite additional K and L peaks. Be sure to get those if you can, and that'll help you understand the potential for peak overlap in the, in the low, regime, low energy regimes. So now that we know that we have this analytical volume and we can control that, the size of that volume, it's, it's rare that we, we can say, well, how deep can I go? Because that's a relatively easy answer. We can, we, by extending that voltage, increasing that voltage, we can drive that analytical volume bigger and deeper. Usually it's the other way around. How small can I go? How surface sensitive can I be? So here, we can manipulate that volume of interaction. The easiest way, of course, is to minimize your incoming beam energy. And state-of-the-art tools at, at this point do exactly that. These tools are optimized to live in the 5 kV, 3 kV, 2 kV regime, giving you EDX spectra. Um, and the quantification, the, the noise in the EDX spectra the resulting quantification and the energy resolution of those peaks within the low energy regime have been improved so you can actually take usable spectra at these low KV and beam energies and be able to do, do a lot of your work at, at those levels. But if you want to go even smaller, then we have to use EDX as an analytical tool, but literally change tools. So, when we talk about EDX, we're, we, we have been talking about EDX in an SEM. We can always do the exact same technique, but now in a TEM. And the difference is everything, it has everything to do with the sample. So here, instead of having the bulk sample that we've been talking about uh, through the presentation, when we, when we create a TEM lamella, we take that bulk sample and we make a thin film out of it that encompasses our area of interest. The rest of the material goes away. So now the excitation volume is limited to a very, very thin lamella where this lamella thickness is on the order of 20 to 50 nanometers. Now the excitation volume, instead of being microns, tens of 10,000 angstroms in diameter uh, regime, now we're talking about nanometers essentially the diameter of the beam. X-ray resolution is essentially the diameter of the electron probe. So now when we do our EDX analysis, when we do it in a, in a scanning transmission electron microscope, we can do EDX maps. We can get a map of the of intensity across the surface. In this case, this is a 3.5 device, and we're looking at, at the quantum well structure. And then just by looking at the intensity peaks, we can look at approximate average concentrations, or excuse me, relative concentrations. We can look at width of, of layers. We can look at distribution of particular elements relative to, to the others. In this way, we can drive EDX to it to its ultimate resolution in spatial size, but it takes a TEM to do that. Now we can talk a lot more about TEM, but um, one of my good friends and partners in crime at, at EAG Laboratories is gonna be giving us a, a TEM specific um, seminar next week. I believe it's on Thursday of next week, so a week from today, and he'll talk extensively about TEM and especially about the, the state of the art applications using TEM. So I encourage you all to, to join in on, on that webinar also. So 
Let's go back into our SEM again. Now, additional capabilities. Modern SEMs now have more and more uh, available to them. Focused ion beams are a, a new uh, beam source. So not just electrons, but we can have ion beams in that, in that instrument. Those are dual beam systems. And I'm going to talk about that here going forward. But we also have different detectors. We have EBSD, electron backscatter diffraction available to us also. Again, another detector to give us a different look of the sample surface. Um, there are other, uh, other add-on uh, capabilities for, for TEMs. One of our newest ones, which, which uh, we just acquired, is a cold stage. We can now do SCM with a, with a cryo stage to keep your samples at, at, at liquid nitrogen temperatures. And this is also a dual beam system. So not, not only can we image a sample under cryo conditions, we can actually do cross sections under, under cryo conditions. Very powerful. Um, also, we have nanoprobe capability where we can go in and using the, the imaging capabilities of the SEM, bring down metal tips onto your sample and actually do electrical tests on very specific uh, transistors. Those are the, the capabilities that are, that are possible on the newest SEMs these days. So I'm going to talk about focused ion beam. Really, and, and EBSD uh, is actually going to be a, a separate talk coming within the next couple of weeks. Electron beam backscatter detector is, gives you phase identification, grain orientation, and, and grain size. Focused ion beam, on the other hand, is an excellent method producing cross sections at very precise locations, and also a way to section samples that may be too, too difficult to polish. Also, it's an excellent way to create TEM lamella. So focused ion beam, the key applications. Really, it's a cross-sectioning machine. What it does is be able to give us a cross-sectional look at, at the material. It's great for thin film structures, for failure analysis, structural for analysis, and it's excellent for difficult samples to prepare by mechanical polishing techniques. So soft samples brittle samples, soluble samples that may dissolve either in the water or the alcohol or the glycol that you would use as a lubricant during mechanical processing. All of those, those difficulties go away in a, in a focused ion beam. Also, you can take advantage of an ion beam as a different mode of, of imaging, where an ion beam image gives you a different look of the sample versus a secondary electron image or the backscatter electron image. So again, a, diff a different way of looking at the sample and again, focused ion beam is, at this point for EAG laboratories, the preferred way for, T for TEM sample preparation. There we go. So description of technique, we're talking about dual beam systems since we're talking about SEMs. The dual beam is an ion beam, typically a gallium beam, uh, liquid metal ion, uh, ion gun, and an electron beam. The fib beam, the ion beam, comes in and it is literally a shovel. It will dig a hole in your, in your sample. It will dig a hole deep into your material and leave one of those walls as it digs very, very smooth. Then we take the second beam, which is an electron beam, and look at that polished uh, wall of, of, of the hole so we can then image in in a cross section. What this allows us to do is do precision cross sectioning or where it'd be nearly impossible to mechanically polish to arrive at this particular defect, a single via, which is less than a micron wide, less than a micron tall. To be able to do that is nearly impossible in, in mechanical polish. But with a fib, by being able to localize either by Obert or ME thermal mapping, we can, we can locate that bad via, mark it, and then by using FIB, literally cut and look and walk in and, and discover that exact defect. And then mill in and get to exactly the, the mid diameter of the via to optimize our image of, of, of the defect itself. This is the beauty of, of FIB real-time cross-sectioning and imaging. It will give you a look that will 
really get you get you the information that you need and and get you moving to solving solving your issues. One of the things that that FIB does also is that we have metal deposition capabilities. We can actually take um, an organometallic gas, put it put it onto the the onto the surface of 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 the area of interest, hit it with either the electron beam or or the ion beam, and dissociate, literally break apart that molecule. What will happen is the carbon portion of that, elect of that organometallic uh, gas will go off into the vacuum of the system and the metallic will literally lay down so that we can actually put a strap of material precisely where we want to do our fib cross-section. What that does is allow us to cross-section the surface without changing that surface topography. Here we've put down a, a layer of platinum, a protective metal, and as we etch through, we will etch into that material, but still leave the surface of the sample intact. So this protects the surface, allowing us to get accurate measurements of the layer, layer thicknesses, also get a different look in cross-section of, of the layer structure. And this cut is very typical of what FIB is capable of. Here we're looking at approximately 20 microns in width, about 10 microns deep. This is the typical uh, scenario for us. So if you have thin films that are less than 10, 10 microns deep in, in total thickness, a feature that is within 10 microns of, of the surface, FIB is a better, faster, cheaper alternative than mechanical cross-section. So at this point now, 70% of our cross-sections are done by Focused, focused ion beam milling instead of mechanical cross-section. It's also an indispensable way for TEM sample prep. Here, what we do is we use the FIB as, a, again, a glorified shovel to dig a hole where the feature of interest is on that polished wall. We'll spin it around, dig a second hole. Now the feature of interest is captured in that little veil of material between the two holes. We'll do side cuts to, to um, begin the release, and then we'll bring a needle in um, that's part of, of the instrument. We'll bring it in very close, and then using that organometallic gas, literally weld our TM lamella to that needle. We'll cut off the bottom with the fib, and then put it into or put it onto, excuse me, a TEM grid for imaging. We'll take this, this TEM lamella, put it onto the grid, again, weld it on there using the organometallic gas, and then do a final thin with, with the FIB to get it to be uh, electron beam transparent and ready for TEM imaging. At this point now at EHG Laboratories, I would say 97% of our TEM lamella are produced in this fashion, primarily because the areas of interest, what is of interest to our clients is needs to be contained within this, within this lamella, and we can do that precisely with an FIB cross-section. So in summary, the focused ion beam, it combines all the benefits of an SEM column and allows us to do precision cross-sections in real time. It's an excellent method for creating TEM cross-sections at very precise locations. It's also an excellent way to produce polished cross-sections on difficult samples, ones that have different hardnesses, that can smear, that are otherwise unable to be done using traditional mechanical uh, processes. It's faster, easier, and cheaper than doing a mechanical cross-section. Limitations, not useful for larger cross-sections. Typical, again, typical uh, dimensions for, for a focused ion beam cross-section is 20 microns wide, 10 microns deep. Can we do larger? Absolutely. Can we do deeper? Absolutely. But time is money. And these, these are typical of what you need. Yes, we will absolutely uh, help you in getting to the feature of interest in the most efficient manner possible. Uh, the newest 
uh, and next generations of focused ion beams actually have capabilities for doing larger cross-sectioning uh, using not just gallium but xenon uh, gases instead. So larger cross-sections are also possible. And then samples must be vacuum compatible. So to close up, SEM EDX, it's a great first look. It's a relatively fast and simple technique to operate. You get image resolution on the order of one to two nanometers. Combining it with EDX, it provides elemental identification and mapping capabilities for distribution of elements. And combined with FIB, it gives you precision cross sections in real time. Imaging may, limitations are imaging may spoil subsequent analysis, especially uh, with carbon burn in. And if you need to coat the sample with um, metal coatings to help in, in conductivity, but that can be that can be minimized by other options like low voltage imaging or carbon coating instead of metal coating. And then limit other limitations. Interaction volume will will affect your results and your interpretation of those results. But the powerful thing is using that excitation volume and tailoring it to the exact depths that you need actually will enhance your interpretations. So understanding that excitation volume and taking advantage of it, that I find not to be a limitation, but actually a strength. Quantification, again, sample dependent, can be very accurate under the right conditions, no less so during a failure analysis, but precision, Comparisons between like samples done at the same time under the same conditions, again, a very powerful uh, strength and not necessary a limitation. And then samples must be vacuum compatible again. Complementary techniques. Really, I like to say SEM in EDX is a gateway drug to surface analysis. So really, all the techniques present on our smart chart these are complementary techniques. By getting a good first look and an understanding of what, of what you have, whether it's a stain or a residue or a defect in the material, allows you to see what you're dealing with, allows you to get elemental content, at least at the matrix level. And then if that doesn't solve your problem straight up, it allows you to have enough information to then choose any or or all of the techniques that we have available to dive further and really by by knowing what you have and what and being able to see what you're looking at as far as your problem or your process and what you're trying to take care of the techniques and what you what you want to know will increase exponentially and that's what eag labs is here for to help you First, get that first look, and then move on to a very much more focused view of, of, of your material. So why choose EAG? Well, first and foremost, confidentiality. We are a service lab. We do work for many companies, but your data is your data. We treat com client confidentiality as paramount to our business. You lose trust in us, there goes our business. So confidentiality of your work is number one for us. We have the expertise to help you, the knowledge base, the skill base, the tool base to be able to get you where you need to go. And because we have that, that variety of techniques, we can offer a multidisciplinary approach to support you. We can also scale to demand. We have tools, we have labs um, and capabilities to meet your, your throughput tech, uh, demands, but also your time constraints. We have abilities to give you same day service if that's what you need. I won't even talk about so much about how many tools we have, but really we are the global leader in materials characterization and surface analysis. EAG can help you solve your materials and engineering related issues. Speaking of that, and before I close, I wanna let you also know that EAG Laboratories is committed to the safety of our staff and our clients. So worldwide, we have complied with the latest COVID-19 regulations, both from state and local governments, 
as well as the, the CDC here in the United States. Currently, all of our labs throughout the world are open, but we do have some limitations in customer visits and at sometimes turnaround time. But this is a fluid situation and we are operating our laboratories right now at reduced capacity, but we can, we can utilize our instruments and our workforce around the world to get you the turnaround time that you need. And we encourage you to give us a call, discuss your options. Even though I'm not allowed in the lab, I am on the phone 10 hours a day, making sure that your, your needs are taken care of. 